You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Adele Anderson. Uh, she's got a website called Life Coach Adele, A-D-E-L-E. Uh, she's, uh, I don't know, we'll, we'll see what she has to say. So Adele, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm really good. Thank you for having me. I am yeah, an NLP what? trainer, if that's what oh, you were okay. looking at. <laughs> Neuro linguistic programming, gotcha. Well, okay, so for people that don't know, what what is uh, NLP? Well, NLP is a way that we can change the neural pathways within our mind. It teaches us not only how to communicate better, but how we can learn and accelerate our learning. We can actually install the excellence of others, and that sounds kind of amazing, but it works. And I can tell you the science behind that if you would like to know more about that. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, it was found early and you've probably heard studies where they've taken basketball teams and they'll send half of them to their room to visualize them training, um, maybe shooting hoops, shooting from the free throw line. And the other half they take to the gym and they actually get them to physically practice. And they found through a process of visualizing in a very special way that both parts of those participants would gain skill and become better through the process. So it doesn't always have to take that we physically have to do it because our brain doesn't recognize the difference between reality and fantasy. And that's why we have different emotions when we watch movies. And if you've ever watched um, Jaws in the 70s, did you ever lift your feet up off the floor because you, you know, you had that feeling like you were going to have Jaws come past your couch. Well I, well, I don't know if this is the same thing, but when I was little, I remember uh, probably because of stuff I saw on TV, you know, I would be afraid at night to you know, have a, my leg hang over the edge of the bed and something would come up under the bed and grab it or, you know, where the bed yeah. met the wall, if stuff fell in the crack between the two, like, I think it's probably from Poltergeist, maybe the clown under the bed, but anyway. <laughs> exactly. Our, our mind takes it all in, right? All of our yeah. uh, sensory experience from the moment we became conscious, so everything that we hear, smelled, taste, felt kinesthetically, or um, saw, or even uh, physically on, the, on our body, or emotionally within our mind, is all logged inside our subconscious brain. So all of this information is there, and it's, it's sort of accessible when we feel emotions, or we, a really strong one is our visual connection to it. So then those memories can come back quite quickly in those situations. So what, what's an example of how NLP could be used to help somebody? What, what's an example problem that's common and, you know, how does NLP help? Yeah, I do a lot of emotional trauma work. So people ha- have, you know, emotional baggage that's built up a trauma or a wound that's resulted from an experience they've had in their lives, and they're just not getting over it. So when we understand that this little sticky neuropeptide is attached to the five most common emotional feelings that we have, which are hurt, anger, tra- um, hurt, anger, sadness, guilt, and fear, 
So all pretty generic stuff. And when these emotions rise up with today's experience, it brings together that powerhouse of all of those emotions that came before. So it quite often interrupts our ability to be the best that we can be. So people will come to me and I will use a process of NLP. And I have to do a little bit more explaining in the way that we understand that emotions are connected with physiology. So when we have a feeling of hurt, we actually feel it physically within our body, a certain respiration, heart rate, body temperature is attached to that. We used to have to do talk therapy. But what we've learned through NLP and other like practices is that we can change the physiology while we have somebody recall that state. So if you can imagine three circles on the floor, one is the recall circle, where I bring a full expression into your neocortex of what that looks like inside your body. So we give it a shape, a sound, a texture, an odor, if it has any movement or vibration or beat. We really flush it up to bring that memory out of the subconscious mind and bring it into focus in the conscious mind and then we can manipulate that so just so like we have what's an example like like what if you told me uh i don't know let's say i you know, i'm sad a lot and i don't know why you know would you tell me like think about a time where something happened where you were really sad and i would start reacting to it physically and then you'd coach me through what minimizing that physical disturbance or What's the the framework of what you do? That's that's the first part of it. So, you know, you're in an imaginary circle on the floor recalling that experience and fully feeling it and giving it physicality by giving it a shape, a color, a texture, an odor. So a sensory expression of what that feels like inside your body, even a location Mm -hmm. inside your body. And then I step you through another circle, imaginary circle that's neutral. And then into a third circle, which is in front of a chart that I'm going to use to not only refocus your mind, but I'm going to give you a task to do at the same time, which is going to alter your physiology. So I'll explain it a little bit deeper. If you can imagine just a chart that has three words on it, red, blue, and green. And the chart has, just like you're reading a book, maybe 15 rows. But the trick is is that each one of those words is mismatched with the color that they represent. So red might actually be written in green, and blue might be written in red, and red might be written in green. They alternate. So you have about 70 of these. You read them like a book, and I want you to tell me the color, not the word, because that's a two-step process in our brain. We can quickly read it. But it takes us an extra little step for us to take the color and ignore the word. So we do that the first time. The second time, when the color is red, I ask you to put your right hand up. When the color is blue, I put your left hand up. And when the color is green, I ask you to clap. And we go through it once more, one more time. And on the third time, we ask you to add the opposite leg. So if the right hand went up, the left leg would go out. The left hand goes up. For blue, the right leg goes out. And when it's green, you clap and you jump. So what this does is like doing a little bit of aerobics, but it completely focuses your mind on something else other than what we were doing a few minutes ago, recalling that sadness. And it increases your respiration because you're doing an activity. It increases your body temperature and your heart rate. Therefore, I've changed your physiology. So then we, and typically people laugh because it's fun. So then we step back through neutral and then back into the recall circle. And I ask you to recall that event. And typically people can't find it in the mind. And even, um, you know, people find their partners on an internet um, dating site or they find, um, you know, something in their environment that has really been a provocative shock to their system. And literally yeah. within 15 or 20 minutes, they can't find it. It's, it's just like the neural pathway has been disconnected. And mm. so therefore, they can go back home and have a conversation about this without an emotional reaction to it. And that's empowering. Are there, um, 
have you optimized this? Like, you know, you have your red, blue, green thing. You know, I imagine like, what if you, I don't know, just have a big ball, a beach ball, and you stand there with the person and like toss it back and forth yes. and try to, you know, get it, get it past them or something. Would that work? Or is that too much? Is there, so is there a way of doing this where it works? Or is there a way of doing this where it's too much stimulation and the person can't, it doesn't work to disconnect them from the bad feeling. It just, it's just too much for them regardless. Well, I, I tell you, I've done it in different ways. I do use balls, like bouncing balls. And we can use, and this is for, like I've worked with children as young as five. And um, they can say colors. They don't necessarily read the words yet. I think the one boy was actually four. But we would do um, the alphabet while we're tossing a ball. So if he said A, I would say B and hand him the ball. Then he would say C, hand me the ball. I would say D, mm. hand him the ball back. So this action, again, of physically doing something while concentrating on a task can do the trick. So, again, with this child, okay. he was um, – sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm just saying, okay, I'm listening. Got it. Yeah, with this young boy, he um, had been in a situation, and there was a bunch of kids that it happened to where maybe uh, – someone in the community was messing with them. And there was a whole bunch of kindergarten kids that were talking about suicide. And so it was quite alarming for not only the community, but the parents that were involved. And this one boy, he was really acting out. He, his personality uh, had changed or his disposition has changed. He was quite, um, you know, self-harm, hitting himself on the head, hitting his parents, jumping when he was in my office, jumping from chair to chair. He was just really feeling out of control with himself. And we ran these games and literally he completely restored. And I've heard this from so many clients. It feels like you have a central nervous system reset. He, he became this calm little person on the, on the floor, just cross-legged petting my little dog. And this has been well over a year now. I, I'm a, I know the parents and I know the child and um, it has stayed that it's not a temporary fix. It's it seems to be a a fix that stays within that person's mind. Okay. Yeah, so it's kind of cool. Hmm. But, you know, you've probably um, heard of other games where they're doing them in schools now, and they are using bouncing balls, and they'll do a little routine. So similar to learning a type of aerobics, um, and you know, you can maybe say, well, it's a combination of NLP and EFT where they're physically feeling a ball bounce and being caught. They'll do some clapping. Um, they may stomp their feet. So they're getting auditory. They're getting the kinesthetic feeling. They're um, saying some words. So you're getting this entire sensory expression, which really focuses the mind and reduces stress, anxiety, improves their ability to focus and uh, in, engage with others. It's considered a real, um, a real good tool to accelerate a child's ability to learn and concentrate. So, what if you're working with someone and this works, and then you have to work with them again, and they say, "I don't want to do this crap, or this is not working, or I just can't get my head into this today." Um, yeah, well, it's... if people are going to do this on their own, or if you're going to do it repeatedly, I would figure you have to change it up. So there's got to be some way at some point to get someone so engaged that no matter how down in the dumps they are or resistant, that they still engage. Completely. I, I get that. And with younger children, you have to be more, um, you know, engaging. An adult who's already experienced it knows the benefits, but a child has a shorter attention span. So definitely we have to switch it up. And I've even worked with a woman who had been to every, she had fallen down a set of stairs and had um, constant twitching on the left side of her face. And she'd been to every neurosurgeon in anything in the medical end to help her and nothing would other than Botox. And this particular game would stop the twitching on her face. It wasn't permanent, but I was really um, amazed with the amount of relief that she got through this process of focus. But, you know, NLP has hundreds of ways that we can engage um, with the mind and, you know, move or rewire those neural pathways that 
are interrupting our ability to be happy, to move forward in life, to just, uh, you know, reduce stress, whatever it is that you're coming for, there's, there's definitely an option within that that can, you know, help you in, in your trouble. Okay. So what's a, I mean, I don't know, when, when you interact with clients, I know it depends on their situation, but I don't know, what, what are some of your favorite techniques? Is NLP sounds like, you know, the predominant one. Are there any other uh, great techniques to help people? And how is that paired with certain problems that they'll have? Yeah, if it's emotional baggage, like if it's, um, you know, a trauma from the past that you're not um, being able to release. And a lot of people don't want to talk about it. And they actually don't have to in this therapy. Like my background is um, in natural medicine, where we actually go back and do a lot of, um, you know, I hold the space and hear people's stories. But with NLP, you can really do that within the mind. And you don't have to necessarily verbalize it to someone else if it's too difficult. So we, um, I love to do timeline, for example. So within your mind, if I asked you to close your eyes and then ask yourself in which direction is my future, and you will get an understanding if it's some people it's in front of them, some people it's above them, some people it's to their right. So everyone's individual. Then I ask the second question, in which direction is your past? And again, the person will be able to indicate in which direction that is. And then within our mind, we have this visual representation, directional representation of where the past and the future is. And then we ask permission for both the conscious and the subconscious mind if they're ready to release these emotions. And when we get the nod for that, what we can do is do a visualization where I Um, put you into a light state of meditation, do a a little bit of a hypnotic induction. And then within the mind, I ask your subconscious brain to source the earliest experience in your life that holds this emotion. And then we ask you to visualize yourself rising above this timeline and floating back in time to locate that. And we look at it from three points of view. We look at the experience the first time from the post experience point of view. So looking down and forward at the event, you've already come through the event, you've safely exited the other side, or at least you are a survivor. And from there, we move above the event. Because we are visualizing it, depending on how painful this is, we could make the, the vision smaller we could change it to black and white. We can manipulate that experience in a way that makes it less frightening for someone. Mm. And that experience, why the emotion is holding there is because it's attached to a neuropeptide, a negative charge within your mind. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to move it into positive physiology by asking your mind what you learned. What positive thing did you learn through this experience? And some people come up with like 20 or 30 amazing things that they've learned through this really challenging, sometimes horrific experience. And then we go further back in time, one to two days, possibly a week prior to the event ever taking place. And then we turn and look back and down at the event. So again, I'm giving the mind clues of where it is, how they're looking at this event so that it they're not in the event. Um, and then if they had not experienced that emotion before, when I asked them if the emotion exists in this experience, they shouldn't be able to find it because the experience logically hasn't taken place yet, right? So we're manipulating the mind. And then if the answer is that they cannot feel the emotion, then we can travel forward in time, passing over that event, gathering up all of those resources that we've identified as positive takeaways, and then moving back towards the future again. And again, we stop at all of these events on our path back to today. And we do the same process, starting with the post event on above the the current 
or above the event that you're wanting to look at and then pre-event. And by doing this, we're able to release that negative experience and give them a lot of very important life skills that they take forward with them today. Um, And then we can even go further and we can take them beyond today. We can take them three months, six months, one year into the future with all Mm -hmm. of the knowledge that they already have. And as that future person to visualize what their life looks like then with these new skills, with all the things that they've learned. And then visually we have them turn around and make contact with their person today their younger person or the person who's currently there. And again, this is all done within the imagination. But as we discussed earlier with movies, our mind doesn't recognize the difference. So it takes everything at face value. So then that person can then talk to their younger self at any one of these points and take their hand and lead them forward, you know, giving themselves their own support, um, giving themselves their their future resources today. It, it's quite phenomenal what we see in change in people, uh, where you can have somebody who comes in quite traumatized in your office and they leave feeling relaxed and empowered. Yeah, it's great. <clears throat> yeah, it's weird. I was, I was thinking, like, what if you made uh, someone's trauma into like a, you know, a mini graphic novel? We had someone draw it up for them and show them. I wonder what that effect it would have. I imagine like the cartoon balloons and, you know, the characters and all that. I, I don't know if it'd be good or bad. It just came into my mind as you were speaking. Yeah. Well, you know, that is that is a tool that you can take a trauma like that and you can um, speed it up so that their voices sound like you've been with a helium balloon or, mm-hmm. you know, you can put great big funny clown shoes on them or, you know, a funny hat or relate it to an experience that's fun. We can change colors. So if people see stress as black or gray, we can have them infuse that with yellow or pink or whatever their favorite color is. So we can manipulate how our memories work. And truthfully, science says every time we open a memory, it is changed and altered in some way. So, you know, you can see how that can take you down the garden path or it can take you down the rabbit hole. Have you ever tried to... um... I don't know, have someone experience, so memories that are really, really painful. Have you ever had someone try to experience parts of a memory, just the, the beginning few seconds or maybe just the resolution? And does that have any effect on the memory? But they can't, if they don't want to access the whole thing. Yeah. What we do for really painful memories is a disassociation. So imagine watching yourself on a television set Or imagine going into a movie theater and watching a movie of yourself going through that. And if it's too painful, then you can go up into the projector room and know that there is a glass window between you and that you have controls of the volume and the blurriness or the, you know, the, all of those things are within your control. So we can even have you in the projection booth watching yourself sit in the theater, watching that person watch yourself on the movie. So depending on how painful it is, we can use these points of disassociation to create that less real, less painful effect within the body. Okay. Yeah. Are there any type of uh, experiences or people that just for some reason, it's very difficult for them to, for this to work for them? Well, as with, most things, they have to come through the door. (laughs) So they have to have reached that point in their lives where they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. And, you know, I've had two calls in the last two days where they're just like, shred me open. And I was like, this isn't going to, this doesn't have to be painful. And so I think a lot of people have that fear that if I take this on, I'm already in so much pain and this is just going to cause me more. And, mm-hmm. and I really feel that that stops a lot of people from finding the help that they need, where this is, this is a very kind, safe environment where you will feel nurtured and cared for, at least in my office. <laughs> so, you know, to have that knowledge ahead of time, that what we're about to do is about freedom. It's not 
about having you re-experience the trauma that has really affected your life for a very long time. So for people to understand that it's different, modern therapies are quite different than what they used to be. And, you know, we can, we can overcome the pain. So uh, are people going to go through a, a time, even maybe even for a few minutes, where it is going to be really intense and bad? And they just, uh, do you prepare them if they have to do that? Or is it, I mean, is the experience difficult? Is there like a trough, a point where it's going to be really intense, but then they'll feel better on the other side? Yeah. You know, we, we do have a pre-talk so that they can understand the experience that they want. And they can choose whether they want to go back and, um, you know, with some people that have been really traumatized, I give them tools before. So, for example, if I was, le- if I was to ask you um, what your expression of calm was or what your expression of happiness was, and to locate that in your body and tell me the shape, tell me the color, tell me the texture, how big is it? Is, you know, what does it do? Is, is there movement to it? Is there a a pulse or a vibration, a sound, you know, we we flush it out like it was a real object. And then we can actually take that outside of the body and we can manipulate it. So quite often I would take, you know, I can think of one client who it was the death of her, her, her brother had committed suicide and she still carried this black ball inside of her gut every single day. It never left her. And so we, you know, we create that physical identification within the mind and then we change it. So, for example, if it's spinning to the right, I might ask them to spin it to the left. If it's feeling like it's going to drop, I'll ask them to throw it in the air. And quite often I throw it, have them throw it up very high in the atmosphere. So it's a meditation where you see it moving up through the blue sky, through the white clouds, over the you know, the tree topped mountains, you know, feeling the wind moving through the atmosphere, passing above planes, moving outside of our atmosphere, past the moon, circling the moon, and then finding its way back like a feather, you know, flowing back and forth, finding its its way home. And then we bring that vision back and it lands in their hand. And then I ask them, what does it look like now? And it continually changes with each one of those that it might take us a dozen efforts to move this energy. But I can tell you, I've done it so many times that it always ends up as bright white love, light and love. And then we take that and we put it back into the body so that we have altered it um, forever. So they can take the love that they had in this situation and hold that, hold that space within their body, but not the pain of having somebody, you know, tragically take their own life. Okay. okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So what's the, uh, how can people engage with you? I mean, you know, do well, they have to be local? Can they engage with you over Skype or phone or what's, how do you yeah. work? I use Zoom. I, I mean, I do have Skype, but I find Zoom has the capacity for me to, record the session. We can both see ourselves on the screen. I can send charts if that's what it is. Um, With a young person I'm working with right now who really struggles with high anxiety and um, has been diagnosed with with ADHD. And we had a fabulous first session last week. And so I asked his mother to pick up certain props. Like I did ask her to pick up three balls, one red, one green, and one blue ball. Um, You know, I email PDFs of the charts that I want to use. But for the most part, for children, they are already in a different brainwave from us and they spend more time in their subconscious brain than we do. So we use metaphors, story to really engage with them. Um, You know, having them understand a concept by relating it to something they already know. So I may study the movies that they like or the video games that they like to play. Um, Who are the characters within those movies? 
and video games that they admire and what are their those traits. So then I can use that, those within a metaphor. Um, and it doesn't really matter if they're in my office or not. We're, we're having a, a very engaging one-on-one conversation um, that it works, it works really well. Okay. And again, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Well, my email is yes at lifecoachadel.com. They can see all my information on lifecoachadel.com. I do lots of live events on Facebook. So I am your destiny coach. We'll get you to my Facebook page um, for business people. Adele Anderson is my LinkedIn profile. Um, so there's lots of ways for people to reach me. And then probably on your info, I may have that um, as a link for them. Well, very good. Well, Adele, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity, Richard. It's fabulous. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.